Never lucky enough to win the Powerball, our next storyteller is a professor. <laughs> a professor of electronic media and broadcasting in the School of Media and Communication in the College of Informatics at Northern Kentucky University, the same department that produced the students running tonight's live stream. Academically and creatively, and even in his free time, he focuses on media aesthetics, digital cinema, and creating media internationally. On a personal level, he's Kim's husband and Zoa's dad. Please welcome Chris Strobel. I never really believed in luck. I mean, I understand the concept and that sometimes things happen that you don't intend and it's good and so, you know, that's luck. But I don't think that, you know, anybody or anything is lucky or not lucky. I think it's really more all of a perspective. I mean, because what may, be, may seem like it's bad luck at one time or for someone may be good luck for someone else or at a different time. I mean, it's all kind of a spectrum. It's, it's yin and it's yang. Well, when I was uh, in high school, uh, I was a tennis player, and I was a, uh, a four-year letterman. And before you think that's really good, um, for high school tennis teams, you need seven players, and my high school had six. <laughs> and my best friend, or one of my best friends, he was the star, so I became lucky number seven. Um, let's just say I learned on the job and uh, no one would ever con confuse me for Bjorn Borg. Uh, uh, for any young folks in the audience, Bjorn Borg was kind of uh, a Roger Federer for my time. Um, well, by my senior year, you know, as we all do, we, I wanted to go to prom with my girlfriend, and. Um, I don't know, you know, if you've gone to prom, you know that that's kind of expensive. You know, there's a tux, and I wanted to go to the best restaurant in town, because we were going to be taking her 1965 mint condition cherry red Mustang hardtop on this. Yeah, yeah, it was nice. Um, but that also meant I needed to be top notch, and that meant I needed some money. So I got myself a summer job, and I was delivering papers on a bike route. And when you're jumping on and off of a bike, um, you know, sometimes injuries happen. And so one day I was, uh, I was going to the restroom, actually, and I was at the urinal, and I had this kind of a thump. Well, okay, that's weird. So I kind of feel around, and my right testicle is like three inches long and rock hard. I'm like, huh, that's different. But it didn't hurt. So I kind of forgot about it and just uh, ignored it for the rest of the summer until I had to get my physical to play tennis. And so I passed that physical, including the lovely turn your head and cough. And the doctor was standing up and I was like, hey, all right, I should, doc, can you take another look down here? Because I, I think I bruised myself jumping on off the bike and it's not gone away. And he was like, oh, OK, he examines me. And he stands up, he looks me in the eye, and he turns and he walks out of the room. I was like, okay, I'm gonna pull up my pants, <laughs> wait here for a little bit. He walked back in, he said, first thing tomorrow, you have an appointment with your urologist because it wasn't a bruise, it was cancer, testicular cancer. Yeah, I was 17 years old. Now, testicular cancer is rare. There's like 10,000 cases uh, diagnosed every year. But it's also the most common type of cancer for men age 15 to 35. It continues past 35 because other cancers, but other cancers pass it up. It's still, it's still prevalent. It's also one of the most, nowadays at least, one of the most curable kinds of cancer that's out there if you catch it early. So all the men out there, you should be doing a monthly self-exam. Just like a woman does a breast exam, you know, you should be doing a testicular exam. You know, all of you. Or, you know, find a partner and, you know, <laughs> you know, help each other out, you know. Great, 
you know, whatever gets it done, great. But I didn't have that opportunity. For me, I had cancer, and it had to come out. So I learned a new word. Did you know that the removal of a testicle is called an orchiectomy? Yeah, it is. And, you know, if you lose, if you have an orchiectomy, then it's all right, because, you know, it's like why you've got two lungs, you've got two kidneys, two eyes, whatever. Uh, you can function okay with just one. I also learned that there are five different kinds of testicular cancer. And uh, my right testicle was uh, basically uh, just a big old hotbed of seminoma. Now, seminoma is like the weakest of the cancers, the most curable. It's slow, treated with radiation. It's like, cool, that's great. I could do this. Well, they're poking around, getting ready to you know, figure out what the treatment's gonna be, and they notice something weird because they notice that there's some tumors on my left side. And if I have a cancer in my right testicle, my right lymph nodes should be where those tumors are spreading. So they poke around a little bit more, and you know what they found. A little bitty tumor on my left testicle. Bad to worse luck. Because that wasn't seminoma. That's what's called embryonal cell carcinoma. And that is aggressive and tough. It spreads fast. And you need chemotherapy to be able to treat it. And it had spread. I had a, a tennis ball sized tumor next to my left kidney, tumors around my lungs. I was stage three, nothing had entered a, a um, organ yet, but it was close. But that original tumor needed to come out. So, a few more surgeries later, and a bilateral orchiectomy, I was ready to uh, enter chemotherapy. Now, we lived in the vicinity of the absolute best place in the world to be treated for testicular cancer. The IU Med Center in Indianapolis um, was the place. I mean, seriously, there was a sheik, and his son had testicular cancer, and so he flew him to the best place in the world, and he landed and checked in the same day that I did. We drove for an hour. It was great. Well, and the reason that the sheik and I were there was that we were at the tail end of an uh, uh, experimental uh, cancer uh, chemotherapy treatment. Um, and that was producing really good results, which has produced the, uh, the, the cure rate that we have now. And that was all through the, uh, the research and the, uh, uh, the mind of Dr. Lawrence Einhorn. And Einhorn is, uh, you know, he, he's responsible his research is responsible for people like John Cruck and Lance Armstrong, me. Tens, hundreds of thousands of men are alive because of his work. But the chemotherapy's rough. You can get through it, but it's rough. I was in the hospital for a week at a time, had three weeks off in between to recuperate, and I did that for four weeks, four sessions of, uh, in the hospital. Um, I don't really remember too much in the hospital. I mean, I, I, my parents were there. I understand my girlfriend probably visited me, I, but I don't know because I just had this death chemicals just pumped into my body. And that's what chemotherapy is, right? It's poison that kills fast-growing cells like cancer, fingernails, <laughs> hair. Yeah. My mom... When I was at home, she would uh, gather the hair that fell off my head from my pillow each morning. I'd be in a class, and I'd pull it out and drop it, and pull it out and drop it. Um, and it's because I, mean, I, I was in class the next day. I mean, I was healthy besides the cancer. And uh, I, I'd get out of the hospital and go to school. Um, I even played tennis. I, I was actually undefeated. Remember, four-year letterman undefeated my last year because the coach put me in against the worst team in the conference. And, <laughs> but we won, so, you know. <clears throat> Sorry. 
Um, but I also needed to uh, I wasn't stupid. I realized that if I didn't find that original large testicle full of cancer that showed me the other kind of cancer that was eating my body away, um, I'd probably be dead by graduation. But I did find it, and I did have the treatment and then on Friday the 13th of December 1985, the day I was supposed to be opened up and have all of my lymph nodes removed, uh, they told me to go home uh, because my last CAT scan came back clean and um, I was cancer free. Yeah. My hair came back in it had a different uh, texture. It was, uh, had more body. I went from glasses to uh, contacts. I had this whole new look just in time for prom. <laughs> it was great. It worked out well. But, you know, life throws you a curve there. And I was going to be going to college. I was, I was planning to go for a, a string theory, quantum mechanics. Uh, so my dad was a chemist, and I liked the sciences, but I, I, um, I really thought I wanted to, to go into the theoretical physics, light, sound, and you know, teach that. But then cancer came along and made me realize, oh, life can be short. And that takes a long time to get into uh, to research and make an impact on the world. And I could work with light and sound and maybe make movies, and that sounds a lot more fun. So I went that way, and uh, I, I, I immersed myself into it. I, uh, by my junior year of college, I was shooting and, and editing corporate videos and directing the weekend newscasts at WTWO, NBC affiliate in our town. Um, when I graduated a couple years later, I became the production manager. I, uh, so I, I had 13 employees before us and, for us, and we made all the media there, and before I left, I was able to create a kid's show, a live action educational show that aired against um, national cartoon programming and we actually won our time slot. Um, I was able to make an impact. But you know what, the most impactful time of, for me at TV2 was when we, the first time I did the Labor Day telethon and I met the new MDA coordinator. Now, the old folks probably remember what the telethon is for young folks. We used to do like an all-weekend television show. We didn't go off the air. And we were raising money to fight muscular dystrophy. Well, this new MDA coordinator, she was interesting. And uh, I was very magnanimous. And I told the crew that I'd schedule for all, uh, the overnight shift that they, they should just go home. I'll take it for them. And Kim and I talked all night. And by the end of the night, I knew that she was the one. And uh, so I needed her to know on our first date that with the way I'm feeling, before this goes any farther, that I was special. I didn't just have a orchiectomy, I had a bilateral. And I cannot father children. And she said, oh, that's okay, we can adopt. But I do have a question. Yeah? Uh, can you uh, have sex? Uh, yeah. Four months later, we were engaged. And <laughs> next year, we'll have our 30th anniversary. Our lives moved pretty quickly after that. Um, we moved to the East Coast so I could go to grad school to get the degree to be able to teach. Um, I went to film school and um, started a company, a film company, moved back to Cincinnati, did that for uh, four years, started to teach adjunct um, at Southern Ohio College, became the department chair there, did that for a year, Northern Kentucky University called, and I jumped across the river and I've been at NKU for over 20 years. 
I'm now a full professor. I helped design the media aspect of the incredible building that we're in. I've had students and graduates who are in every station in the market. They're in Chicago, New York, LA, around the world. I've been able to teach around the world with my students as I take them on study abroad, and we've made media in South Africa, Belize, Sri Lanka. It's been pretty incredible. But once we started to get that financial stability, we needed to revisit that um, original conversation from our first date. Should we adopt? Well, I remember thinking that uh, long throughout this whole process that all of this may have been God saying, you shouldn't be a father. But I also knew that Kim was going to be a wonderful mother, and I might be able to live up to the example that my dad gave me. So we started the process. And a whole lot of paperwork and a lot of delays later, halfway around the world, we were able to meet our daughter, Zoa. She was 10 months old. And I distinctly remember driving in the, uh, riding the bus um, between Fuling and Chongqing, and Zoa was sleeping on Kim's shoulder, and I knew, I mean, I knew that what I had always thought was the worst part of my life was actually the best. My perspective had changed on that luck. And that's how we see the world, right? But I, I realized that if I hadn't had the bilateral, then the path of my life probably wouldn't have been the same. And I probably wouldn't have met my wife. She says that we still would have, maybe. But I'm sure we wouldn't have been matched with our daughter. And if there's anything in these last 30 years that I think I'm pretty good at, um, and I know she's watching from American University in Washington, D.C. That's my grad school alma mater. When she's studying the, at the School of International Service, which was probably prompted by the study abroads that she would join us on. And she's watching on a stream that's being provided by my students from NKU. If there's something I'm good at that makes an impact, it's being Kim's husband and Zoe's dad. And what can I say? I'm a lucky man. <laughs> Time for Chris. You know, I've known Chris for decades, and it was only recently that I learned this story about his past and his uh, bout with cancer. Um, uh, first of all, I'm so grateful, of course, that he came here to tell uh, us his story, but also, True Theater has just given me like this weird sense of empowerment to talk to people about stories uh, that, you know, from their past that I, I never would have dug deeper into. And for that, I, I, you know, I just, I love true theater and I hope, you know, you'll take inspiration from this and think about, you know, asking people that you know who've been in your life for a long time, something just out of the blue that you may not know about them. What was high school like for you? A friend of mine once asked me, hey, did you ever get fired from a job? And I was just like, why'd you ask me that? Um, and it was just like an interesting conversation. I had to call him back later and say, hey, are, were you trying to tell me that you're getting fired? He's like, no, I was just asking you a question. But that's the kind of thing that, you know, he, uh, it was my friend Jeff who founded True Theater with me. And it's the kind of thing that um, this sort of exposure to stories from the people you know from strangers just does. And I just, I love it. 